Good morning, and a joyful Easter tide to you as you continue to join us in worship. It's hard to believe that it's only been one week to the day since our Easter celebration, but we continue forward celebrating some wonderful Easter imperatives. Joining in with us this season is a selected set of gospel lessons that has us listen to Jesus as we sit at his feet, hear his acclamation of peace and the lack of fear that inspires us to join him in spirit as we participate in his wonderful promises. As you celebrate this Easter season with us, we pray that you'll join us in hearing and certainly assenting to the commands of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In this worship hour, we join again with the disciples locked away in their room and especially visit today the likes of Doubting Thomas. While we find that Doubting Thomas within each of us, we also look forward to the way when Jesus asserts his peace on us. And as we have opportunity to hear that kind of message today, I think you, like me, are finding ourselves in a climate where we sorely wish to see Jesus and we ache for his divine ambush upon us. As we celebrate the worship hour this evening, a note as we gather for worship. If you'll join me, especially on screen, we'll see the beginnings of this wonderful series of the Easter. Easter imperatives. Sometimes the simplest of words carry the greatest importance. As Jesus speaks with the doubting disciple Thomas gathered in a special room with the disciples a few days after the resurrection, Jesus says simply, see, but that is all that he needs to say. It confirms the powerful truth that he is indeed risen from the dead. Today we are faithful, gathered together in a different room, but also with those who are fellow disciples of the Lord. And he has promised then to be with us and among us in that upper room. As we worship, we will see signs of his abiding presence. As we begin this Easter season, we join together with a wonderful and comforting hymn that celebrates the joy of Easter, hymn number 482, This Joyful Easter Tide. Three day prayer. 
as we join together at the beginning of this worship hour celebrating the power of God's Word in our midst, I'll invite you to stand as you are able. We join together in the day's litany from Romans 6 and John chapter 20. Alleluia! We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Alleluia! Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Alleluia! Alleluia! Let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may be your grace, confessing in our life and in conversation that Jesus Christ is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. We join together in today's psalmody. You'll notice, especially with the responsive prompts, that there are portions for men and women to read there within the home. I'll be celebrating as I have here in these past weeks by reading every part along with you. We begin with the first phrase, the antiphon from Psalm 148 together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I'll invite you to be seated briefly for the day's epistle lesson. As we turn to the New Testament, we examine on this day 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the very salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now once again, as you are able, I'll invite you to stand as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive the day's gospel. We celebrate our profession of faith, the name of our triune God, and the wonderful work that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit continue to do for our benefit. We share the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. For us this morning, the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. And see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it into my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, saying, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the very Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Please once again be seated. We'll sing together another joyful hymn of this Easter season, hymn number 466, Christ Has Arisen, Alleluia. Christ has arisen, Alleluia. Rejoice and praise Him, Alleluia. For our Redeemer burst from the tomb, even from death dispelling its gloom. Let us sing praise to Him with endless joy. Death's fearful sting. Oh, to destroy 
In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whom we see in this Easter season because he promised. Amen. Remember, in last week's gospel, we had opportunity to hear Jesus share to the women who were obeying the angel's directive to go and share the good news of Jesus arisen with his disciples. Jesus met them on the way and simply said, Greetings. It's a wonderful and great time for those who were aching to see Jesus face to face. And as Mary and Mary and the others saw Jesus there on the road, he said and added to that beautiful message, Go and tell my brothers to head on to Galilee, and there they will see me. And so how wonderful as we enter into this wonderful Easter season, we get to that place where we, in fact, like Thomas and the disciples, see Jesus, but then most importantly, hear his command to keep on seeing. Children in the congregation, as you have the time at home to tune in and see this portion of the sanctuary that you know very well, you might notice some of the furniture from Easter carrying forward into the Easter season celebrates the resurrected Lord and Savior as we see the white draping on the cross and also on the big cross, the wonderful, uh, uh, in a sense, it's, it's kind of like a, a Paul, a burial cloth that covers the altar, but one of those that celebrates life, not the wrappings of death. And then, of course, before us is the Christ candle here. We've often celebrated that when we have candlelight in God's house, one, it makes us pay attention to the front of the room. After all, fire is rather dangerous, so we want to be sure that it is contained. We know that fire can be a very powerful thing. But it also draws our attention because anytime we see firelight, we remember that God himself is present. And so as you take the chance to see Jesus throughout this Easter season, you may not see this candle travel all too far, but with each service there'll be a little movement between now and the Ascension celebration that happens 40 days from now in the same way that you see the candlelight dance in the chancel from one place to another. You too can celebrate the presence of God and the way that he moves in our midst 
midst in the same way Jesus told us to watch for him and to move where he is moving, you and I today get to do the same, to see where Jesus is going and to follow in his footsteps and maybe especially big people included. As much as we keep up with our Lord and Savior Jesus, we're going to try just a little bit to stay out of our Savior's way. Uh, children, especially as you gather, let's pray a repeating prayer today that sets the stage to remember Jesus' command and promise that we will see him. We pray, dear Jesus, today we thank you that you've kept your promise and we get to see your face. Help us remember that though you're not here physically, we will see you we will hear you and we will behold you in the voices of our parents, our brothers, our sisters, and all of those who love you. Help us show love to one another and bless us as we go forth in your name. Amen. Now, big people in the congregation, I admit, the Easter season stories can be all too familiar, especially if you are a fan and follower of the Gospels. We might come again to Scripture and celebrate the familiarity that we have. So often, especially in past generations of preaching, we've been able to identify ourselves as, say, today, a disciple in the locked room. Maybe perhaps one who was in the crowd who surrounded our Lord and Savior Jesus. Other times maybe imagining what it would be like to simply be our own self in Jesus' presence and to ask of ourselves, what are we seeing? What are we hearing? What would we ask of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Perhaps this image that is so rich today brings you to a place where you remember what it must have been like for Jesus to have returned in the midst of the disciples all for the sake of doubting Thomas. Just as Thomas himself said that he would not believe until he in fact saw and touched our Lord and Savior Jesus, Jesus works up a divine rewind of sorts in John's gospel and says, okay, for Thomas, for Thomas, for you. And we can hear that word in our hearts and minds today. For you, Jesus would return to demonstrate that in fact he has risen indeed. Alleluia. Now, perhaps when it comes to selecting who we are in the room, we really cannot escape doubting Thomas today. But maybe it is perhaps just on a, maybe a thousand foot view celebrating the gospel that is in our midst. We could ask this sort of question today, relating all too well to the disciples, especially in the current, uh, current climate in which we live, we get to that place where we too might feel confined and hidden away. So the question is, what does Jesus do when he all of a sudden shows up? And you heard this in the gospel lesson today, a little reading that comes to us from John chapter 20. Forgive me, in the faith family you know sometimes the clicker has a mind of its own. There we go. John chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were out of fear for the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Oftentimes we call this the Easter acclamation, the way Jesus claims us to be his own and gives us what we desperately need in the moment. Jesus in this moment says, Peace. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Now, so many accounts throughout the gospel celebrate these moments when Jesus shows up. And whether or not the disciples or the crowds expect to see Jesus, that's a story within itself. 
but we can share in the same way that we see humans react in the presence of angels. There are times where Jesus shows up and the disciples believe that he's a ghost. Or they don't recognize him until they hear his voice. Or they fall at his feet and worship him out of holy fear. The moments where the fog clears and the dust settles and we find Jesus and Jesus only, we often hear the words to stop, look, listen, behold, and to receive. And as we celebrate the gospel today, we celebrate that reception of that peace that passes all understanding of all things. Now, perhaps most unexpected in this moment, many of the disciples, as you know, even though they had heard the good news of Jesus' own resurrection, could you imagine what it would be like for your Lord and Savior that you so well knew would just simply materialize in the middle of the room? If he did that in your living room or your dining room or your bedroom on a day such as this, what might he catch you doing? Or maybe better yet, accomplishing. If we're all too like the disciples, we come to that place where we figure that we're otherwise hidden or locked away. Two things rise to the top from the entry point into today's gospel. One, we can see what it is for the disciples to behold an all-too-familiar friend, but now they behold him as their conquering Savior. Having witnessed Jesus' own arrest and walking through the betrayal and denials that they themselves underwent and sadly brought to bear on the moments of Jesus' crucifixion, some in the room who were even blessed to see Jesus die, to have bled and breathed his last for the sins of the whole world. As Jesus stands in the midst of the disciples today, those who were gathered could see the scars on Jesus' face. They could see the whip stripes on his back. They could bear the holes that were in his hands and his side. For them, by sight, in Jesus' presence, there was no doubt, this is Jesus. Now, apart from the glory and the holy fear that must have overcome them, prompting Jesus to issue his peace, again, there's a point of relation where we come to find even we too. There are times where we think we're otherwise hidden and locked away. So when Jesus shows up, there's a moment of astonishment. There might even at times be a moment of shame in the presence of the Lord. And with holy fear, whether that's a recognition that we are either creatures in the realm of our Creator or children of our Heavenly Father, either way, there's a moment of deep respect and honor because you can see physically before you the sacrifice that was made and the life that was given so that you can have life. With a command that Jesus eventually shares in the gospel, and we'll make our way that direction today, it makes me ask a wonderful question, and that is to say, for as much as Jesus shared with his disciples and us to go on ahead and to be prepared and ready to see him, I might ask you as I ask myself, how do we see Jesus in the light of both Good Friday as well as Easter? Over the course of this last little while, the children in our congregation have been bringing together some handicrafts and some artwork that really definitely bears the light of Christ. And in a moment where things otherwise seem to be uncertain, unpredictable, and even on days where it's like doom and gloom and death toll is on the horizon, how beautiful to see this balance of justice and love. I want to share with you today just a couple of pieces that have come in from some of our Sunday uh, school students. The first is from a young man by the name of Luke who titled this little picture Easter Morning. Now, in a sense, that song, Old Rugged Cross, comes to mind because you can see what's on the hill far away, the old rugged cross. But if you notice, as Luke depicted, you have this brilliant sunrise in the background, and the sun is shining through this beautiful crown atop the Lord's cross, no longer a symbol of death, but a symbol of life. How wonderful. And Luke, especially if you're tuning in, whether you're tuning in Sunday morning or Wednesday night, thank you for sharing this piece, not only with us, but 
but by and large with the world. Another one of our young disciples here, Nora, she put this one together. And if you're one who celebrates especially what we shared on this past Maundy Thursday, celebrating the covenants of God, well, there again you have Calvary's Hill, and you've got Jesus' cross. You can even see his name spelled out on the cross beam. Maybe for you where you're sitting today, you can strip away Jesus' name and place your own. The sign of the new covenant that has the celebration of the rainbow in the background. You get to see the bookends of salvation history all rolled up into one. Even as St. Paul would share, if it was not for the death and the the resurrection of Jesus, if it was not for his cross, Jesus crucified, and his empty tomb, our faith would be a lie. And so with that, if it is, of course, that a picture is worth a thousand words, this is one of those beautiful images of our Lord and Savior that speaks volumes. How do you have opportunity to see Jesus today? Whether it might be in a little portion of artwork or it might be a word of kindness, whether it might be a devoted action like throwing your hands into service for someone else or maybe even those beautiful gifts of passive service where you can be a listening ear and provide counsel and aid to those who are suffering in our current climate. God bless you. Jesus himself moves swiftly to a beatitude to close this moment for the disciples, but it's not before he comes to a place of holy command, a divine imperative that would help us to keep on seeing him for the sacrifice that he's made and the future that he's preparing. We believe and we see. As John's gospel continues, this is how we find doubting Thomas and the wonderful love of Jesus that manifests himself when he is present with them. John's gospel shares these words, The other disciples told them, We have seen the Lord. But he, Thomas, said to them, Unless I see, I will never believe. Eight days later, Thomas was with them, and although the doors were locked, Jesus came again and stood among them again, and he said, Peace be with you. And so then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Put out your hand, place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. As you might be exposed to a wealth of different translations of Scripture, this is coming to us from the English Standard Version in um, a translation often affectionately simply known as God's Word and also in the New International Version. By the time Jesus displays himself for Thomas's benefit, that place that says, do not disbelieve but believe, Jesus seems to be a little more firm in other translations by saying outright, stop doubting. And then swiftly comes to that place of believing. Now for Thomas, and you can imagine, maybe perhaps justified in some strange way in his doubt, The days since Jesus' death for Thomas, the world just keeps turning over in Thomas's head. In the same way that we find our hearts and minds and and spirits rather poor and fallow in the wake of the death of a good friend, if someone came to you today and spoke of a dear loved one who had recently died and said, guess what, they've come back to life, Maybe our gut reaction is to be all too much like Thomas. For as much as we pin Thomas for the likes of, say, fear and doubt, we know that those things still circulate within us. At times, we can be just as skeptical as Thomas. We can feel marginalized when the wealth of those who are around us would continue to encourage us and hold fast Here the Psalms are actually rather clear and wonderful. If you know someone who is suffering and going to a place of deep grief, especially in the wake of the reality of death, well, the Psalms are quite clear. We don't don't sing songs to a heavy heart. 
in the midst of all of the hymns and celebrations of the apostles who want Thomas to have that moment, Jesus shows up and he shares with them a wonderful command and a beatitude that they can continue to see. They can continue to behold. For Thomas, this gospel is rather sensory in the way that he not only gets to place his fingers into the nail marks of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but if you noticed from this gospel, it's a place that I go to all too often when I need to hold fast to the assurance of our living Lord and Savior. Do you see here where Jesus says to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, put out your hand, and place it in my side? Wow. What a great moment for the likes of Thomas. I've shared this in the past with our adult Bible studies, but I believe it so sincerely that we don't have this language as just a coincidence. We're meant to take something away. If you needed to know that someone was otherwise alive and well, you could do two things. You could either put a mirror or a hand up under their nostrils to see if they were still breathing, You could give them something to eat, which happens in one of the Gospels. Or you could place your hand in such a way that you could feel a pulse. Could you imagine what it would have been like for Thomas to place his hand into the Lord's side if only to literally feel his Savior's heart beating? Wow. It's a whole new way to behold the resurrection. For someone like Thomas and for you and for me today, where the world is otherwise mixed and our hearts and mind get muddled in the mess of the life, an Easter acclamation of peace is not something that we're all too willing to hear in the moment. It's something that almost has to creep up and ambush us so that we finally come to a place of faith. And so maybe like Thomas, in the midst of the muddle, we have these questions to ask and a beautiful way to continue to behold Christ. One, the rumors of the resurrection would have us beg for Jesus to intrude in our lives. Maybe you're like me when you take the full inventory of John's gospel. You come to a place where you get to see the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus. You get to see the resurrection moment of that first Easter. You get to celebrate the way that Jesus fulfills prophecy and promise by continually appearing to those who were in good faith. Maybe your prayer is like mine, especially in a climate such as ours. And even in the midst of, say, things like disease, that spiritual disease that is sin, we beg Jesus to show up. Jesus, invade our lives. In some ways, being in John's gospel, it's like fast-forwarding to the end of St. John's revelation and echoing that prayer, come, Lord Jesus, and come quickly. How much do we need this same sort of ambush? I don't know what it's like for you, but too often I find myself thinking along the lines of Thomas that unless I see it, I won't believe it. Jesus' presence kind of turns that phrase around. I I know and respect a very beloved pastor who is my own father that often turns the phrase in this way, not simply to say that when I see it, I'll believe it, but saying instead, I'll believe it because I see it. We get into that place in Christ that as we see, we not only begin to believe, but we keep on believing in such a way that we can't help but see the way that our Lord completes his promises. How often, like Thomas, do we beg for something like a divine interruption? In these days, it seems to be moment by moment, just as we shared with the children in the children's message, we know that Jesus still makes these moments rather sensory for us. We get to be his hands and feet as we serve one another in the way that you are served even in your own home life. Those who are being Jesus to you help to see the way in which you're continually provided for and delivered. 
whether it might be the spoken word or something that's shared by way of gift, Jesus still gives us these tangible elements to see that he'll provide for us here and now, but he'll also set the stage for the future when it comes to sight and taste and hearing. You might be on the receiving end of a comforting word, whether it's a text or a phone call. You may be pointed away from your own self or the current situation and say, let's go for a walk and see the horizon again and know that we're part of something that is so much bigger than we can ever ask or imagine. Jesus brings us to that place where much as he did for Thomas, though we cannot see him physically, it's as if to say we have these little whispers in the air, his guiding spirit that comforts and aids us and continues to advocate for us when we're not even so sure what we might think or say in the presence of Jesus when he shows up a beautiful building on the foundation of this gospel when the world perpetually turns over in our minds and we're caught up in the mess and the muddle of life jesus comes yet again to be that call and for as much as he himself is peace he brings us to be in a place of peace with him As we celebrate a season of Easter imperatives, we come to this place where yet again Jesus issues a command and a question, and from that question gives a beautiful promise. When Jesus shows up, when he enters the room, when he comes to you and is as if to say, sits at your side today, he'll share those same commands that he did with the disciples at the empty tomb and in the locked room. A word of peace and promise. A word that says, keep on watching. Behold, pay attention, listen, look, and see. And in the moment that we have opportunity to see, in that same moment as as a divine miracle, our hearts and minds and lives are transformed so that we not simply believe by way of agreement, but our whole heart and mind and soul is moved to love one another and to serve the Lord and continue to obey his commands as he would direct us. Celebrating the Easter imperative of C, my prayer for you today is that as you hear that wonderful command, you too turn that phrase like Thomas. Instead of saying, I'll believe it when I see it, you begin to say all over fresh and new in Christ that you'll see it when you believe it. To him be all glory forever and ever. Amen. As we move forward in service today, at this time, I'll invite you to stand as we echo the prayer of the church. Many of you in this last week have received the notice that in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, our congregation has come upon its first death, not according to the disease or any strain of COVID-19, but just the same, those who are continuing their lives and the Lord has come to visit them and call them safely home. So we raise our dear sister Terry and her family, especially at the news of her death this last Last Sunday, I can't imagine what it would be like in Christ to be called home to heaven, to be in his nearer presence on Easter morning, but Terry now certainly knows those promises of Easter everlasting. We also raise a number of folks in our midst and a few by name today who are now coping with this disease of COVID-19 and of course continue to remember all of those who suffer the effects of this disease in the social sphere. And so with that, let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We pray for the whole Christian church, that the peace of God would dwell upon it and that the Spirit of God would work through it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and grant us your peace. We pray for the nations of the world and for the men and women entrusted with their leadership that true and lasting tranquility would be known around the globe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and grant us your peace. We pray for this congregation that all of its members would dwell together in unity. Lord, in your mercy, 
Hear our prayer and grant us your peace. We pray for those who actively keep the peace both locally and around the world, including the armed forces of our nation and our local emergency workers and first responders. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and grant us your peace. We pray for those whose lives are in need of a special measure of peace and comfort, the sick and the hospitalized. We lift before you, O Lord, brothers and sisters within our congregation who cope with various illnesses, chronic pains, and cancers. We ask that yet again you would be with and abide with all who are recovering, that your miracles of modern medicine would continue to afford health and well-being for all, and that especially those in our midst and those connected to our congregation in widespread families, those who now continue to suffer with the strains of COVID-19, we pray not only for relief but swift healing. We ask, O Lord, that you would be with those in our congregation who are now recovering, Nancy, as well as Shirley and Warren, Jennifer, Rick, and Rich. In times of various ailments and procedures, we thank you, O Lord, that you've seen these brothers and sisters of ours safely through. We pray for those who cope with cancer, especially before you this day we raise young Piper and little Nolan. We pray for Carmine and for Ron, for Tom, and for joy. We raise to you, Lord, those who are shut in and otherwise home-centered. We pray for Jean and for Marlis and Marge, for Harry and Jerry, for Grace and for Don. We ask, O Lord, for those who long for a cure in these days, that you would continue to be with Jonathan, that in these days where there is now an extension of moratorium within our state, that you would continue to bless the work of all of those who are in the military, all of those who worked diligently, especially with vigilance, doctors and nurses and all caregivers. Yes, Lord, even those within the home. We pray for those who face unemployment. We ask that you would be with those who are underemployed or anticipating a layoff. We pray, Lord, for those who cope with mental health needs and with addictions in this time. We ask that you would be with moms and dads and grandparents and all of those who are invested in schooling and education. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would continue to be with all who continue to distribute food and other services to those who are greatly in need. Finally, O oh Lord, we pray that you would guide and bless the family of our dear sister Terry as the family mourns. O oh Lord, we know that especially in a climate such as this, that a celebration of life everlasting would be delayed. And we pray that especially in this time, you would continue to bring to bear to our minds all of those who have lived and died in you, especially the many who are now rostered with the death toll of the coronavirus crisis. We pray, O oh Lord, that for as much as we see numbers flash upon the screen, that each one of those numbers represents a life, and that you would continue to be our light and life and the sustainer of our hope until the day when you too would call us home. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who are experiencing changes and challenges. We pray for those who are relocating to new situations, for the elderly in our midst as each of these face each new day ahead. We pray, O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and grant us your peace. For all the saints called now to your eternal presence, O Lord, we give you thanks. Grant that we would be blessed by the heritage of faith that they have left to us in our time. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and grant us your peace. Amen. Now taught by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and trusting in his promises, we are bold to share the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
We take this time and portion now of service not only to remember yet again the wealth of those who are tuning in to worship here with our faith family. Thank you for your time, attention, and your offerings before the Lord of prayer and praise. And for the wealth of those who continue to support the ministries of St. Luke's Lutheran Church here in New Richmond. The joy of being an outpost of God's gospel in this time and space. Certainly these things continue to help produce all of the wonder ways in which we're meant to serve our neighbors and to share God's love. For every offering of time and talent and skill and sharing our resources, we remember all of these offerings as we go before our Lord in worship and with the offertory. You may be seated. As we've celebrated in these recent weeks, while we are not worshiping in person, which in effect suspends our ability uh, to make public confession through the Lord's Supper, we remember that the highest point of worship is the moment again where Jesus shows up and proclaims his peace and forgiveness. And so as you are able, even at home, I'll invite you to stand at this time as we join together in our litany of confession and absolution according to Psalm 85. O Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let us now confess our sins unto our gracious Lord. Almighty God, in humility and with repentant hearts we come before you. With shame and regret we admit and confess our sinfulness. We have not lived up to our calling as your peaceable people. We have not done the good you demand and have not been the people you would have us to be. We do repent and are truly sorry for our sins in thought, word, and deed. Have mercy on us, merciful Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son. Forgive us all that needs your forgiving grace, and with the power of the Holy Spirit, direct us to serve you faithfully for all our days through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now remember the good news that is in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God has promised his merciful forgiveness to those who repent of their sins and turn to him in earnest confession. He will revive them and speak peace to his people. In his stead and by his command, therefore, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May God keep you in his grace by the power of his Holy Spirit, lead you in ways of peace and joy, and finally bring you to live with him forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Forgiven and free and just prior to our benediction, we celebrate with a verse of praise uh, stanzas one through three from him 480, He's Risen, He's Risen. He's risen, he's risen, Christ Jesus the Lord. He opened death's prison, the incarnate true word. 
worship, let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. We join together, as is one of our customs here at St. Luke's, to echo the refrains of Easter, sharing together as our conclusion the hymn of the day from this past Easter, hymn number 461, selected verses, I know that my Redeemer lives. <laughs> 